Hi, this is Paul. I'm going to continue on my treatment of Jonathan Peugeot and Brett Weinstein's uh, conversation. The, in part one, I did a substack summary of it a little bit. Jonathan Peugeot and Brett Weinstein can't find each other on the definitions of religion and faith. And I want to pick up the conversation on the defin John's definition of faith, and then we're going to talk about levels. All right. So I'm going to put you a little on the faith thing or what faith is. The way that I, faith is the trust in things that are unseen. That is, at all levels of analysis, the level which is... Now, as I critiqued before, when he says trust in things that are unseen, most modern listeners will jump to the supernatural. And they will jump to a super thing in the sky that is managing things that you can talk to. And I'm not... And I'm saying that once you sort of push scientific people into that frame, that is where they're going to be thinking from. All right. Now, and what Jonathan's going to go into is going to be this conversation of levels. And in the last video, I talked about levels to a degree like my optic nerve is not seeing Kermit the way I am seeing Kermit. And just like the... Um, the genetics in each of my cells is not little GATCs, like little alphabet soup all strung together in a helix. No, that's um, the level. You've got a level. He's going to mention level of analysis. That's usually the language that Peterson uses, but we've been paying attention lately to levels. The neurons in my brain are not processing. They are processing, but they are not aware Again, where our language sort of turns us into little panpsychists here. They are not aware of what myself as the conscious individual person that I am is aware. Be above it is unseen from that level. Okay, so what I mean is that if you're analyzing something at a molecular level, you can never see the apple. You'll see its constituents. If you go down, same problem. If you go up, same problem. If you're talking about the apple and an orchard, if you're looking at the level of the apple, you'll never see the orchard. And so what faith is, is that move between levels. Because from the level in which you are, you if you only take the elements given to you at that level and you analyze them, there's no jump to the higher identity. That jump is always a leap of faith. Once you have it, then you can analyze things at that level. That is, once you reach that higher level, once you, for example, if you... Now, now, if you go back to the beginning of the other conversation when they were talking in November of 2017, this very much is what Peugeot was talking about in terms of being able to see and evaluate. Because again, Peugeot usually talks in spatial terms, geographic terms. So you look down and now you can evaluate because you see the lay of the land. But when you're down below, you cannot. Okay. If you look at the people in a, in, in, a, in a mass, you can't see the city. You have to jump up until you see the city. Once you have the city, then you can use that identity and compare it to other cities and compare it to other levels at, this, at, the, at, the, at the same level. But you, in the way that our mind or our experience tends to work is that we can see parts of things and we can see holes of things. We can notice that things are made of parts and also have unity. But the jump from the parts to the unity is one which is, which is not accessible at the level of the parts. Now, I now, again, I, it's really hard to know how much of this Brett can capture. And again, and that's not a critique or a criticism of Brett because he's not stupid. It's just familiarity with these ideas. This is connected with the a lot of conversations that Jonathan has had. This one, a recent one with with John Verveke about consciousness. And here we've been talking about one level up. These in JP and Rebel Wisdom and uh, and and Campbell's egregores. Do these things have have consciousness? 
Yeah, and it's. I mean, it's hard. It's it's hard to perceive because we're not at that level. Also, we're at the level that we are, so we can't. It's like it's hard enough to ver to. It's already impossible to verify consciousness of another human person directly. You only verify your own consciousness. Uh, so it's it would definitely be very difficult to verify the consciousness of a higher being because you're not you're not there. Sure. Like you're just not at that at that level. Uh, but it would be, it, it, I mean, we would take seriously, and this is perhaps where we differ about whether or not these events have occurred, right? Um, uh, if, uh, you know, if that if that agency started to, like, communicate uh, with us uh, in a self-conscious, self-identified uh, fashion. Right, uh, but you wouldn't, let's say, if the, self, if the agency of the city would start to communicate with us, we would not, we would receive it at our level. So we would get it as a letter from the city saying that they're making taxes higher. That's how we would get it. Like it would come down that way at the level, let's say of the, the level of agency, it would, it would be at a certain level, but at our level, it would be like a new law or a new rule or a new boundary, or we're going to invade this other country, or we're going to defend ourselves from this other thing. And so it, it activates the, the lower beings towards a new purpose that the that the city has contrived or this and there's a, and I would think about the unconsciousness and the consciousness I think that I can see that in a city as well because there's a level of functioning in a city for example that doesn't require high level sure uh, interaction that just kind of runs right it just runs but then something happens like some event that is unforeseen or a change that needs to happen and then all of a sudden everything aligns towards yeah like I said like a, you know, a new, a new, a new tax rate or whatever it is, a new law, or there's a problem, right? You know, there's a, there's a problem and it requires all of a sudden the higher levels of, of this, of the city to activate and kind of communicate down. Um, and you know that that would happen no matter who is there, right? Like no matter who the top levels in the, the city are there, that would happen nonetheless. So it, it is with, with different mayors, with different council people, the, the the spirit of the city the angel of the city the person of the city is is has a being and an entity certainly the city council people and the mayor and the citizens and the police and the fire and the code enforcement and the solid waste collection, all of those people participate in it, but it's a level above. And so they participate in it, but none of them have the power to control it. This is again, back to my school spirit example, where the school has a spirit, the principal, the cheerleaders, the football players, the basketball team, the teachers, the students, the student newspaper, the architect, the janitor, they all participate in the school spirit, but it's a level up. And so Peugeot talks about trust in a level up, but here nicely he says, but you receive the communication at your own level within your own level. Now this, this idea of levels this isn't something that just based on this, Brett will likely sort of get. We've been talking about this stuff together for, you know, six months to a year now. Peugeot's been talking about it quite a bit longer. And even someone like myself who has been, I mean, I had my first conversation with Jonathan about angels years ago. And in some ways, we're just all sort of getting on to the same page now. I'm not sure about this um, because I think there are many places, especially in biology, where at one time we couldn't see the jump between levels, but we figured it out. And now, okay, now what levels is Brett thinking about? Now, this isn't discontinued. So for him, especially genetics are everything. And one person in the in the comment section to the first video said, this 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 conversation is pattern 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 genes 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 and fair enough but the connection let's say that brett perhaps is thinking about is the connection between the genes and myself and and that's a fair one or let's say between the genes and my consciousness 
that that somehow I use the example of the the beauty of the you know seeing the beauty of the young woman who would become my wife and my motivation to marry her and I mean all of that there's certainly genetics involved in terms of going into the the beauty of my wife and my desires for her etc cetera, etc cetera. and he's saying well well now and and again when he says faith he's using sort of the the faith of the gaps let's call it that well we don't we didn't really quite know all of the mechanisms between my genetics and my desire for my wife but now we know more and so faith for him is a this is he's he's using faith in a very different way than Jonathan just used it here now we can and so what you're saying between lovely and biology where at one time, we couldn't see the jump between levels, but we figured it out, and now we can. And so what you're saying, if I understand you correctly, is that the jump between levels is always one of faith. And I would argue that it tends to start as an article of faith. It, it's faith. See, see, again, I think Brett is thinking sort of a faith of the gaps. That, well, we know because we can see that there's a genetic difference, and so that, that genetics then plays a part in my attitude and in romance and in motivation and in desire, and now we know because it used to be faith, but now it's sight because we see all the different pieces. Now, again, that's not an illegitimate definition of faith, but what John is working on is is not something that if you, again, I just got a, a, a comment or I don't remember exactly how the message came to me. Um, I'm pastor, I'm in such and such a city and I want to go to church. And can you can you point me to a church where the, the church and the people are on the same page as all these different conversations? Now, now someone also commented, well, this is, this is what orthodoxy believes. Oh, okay. Uh, if I if I pull up to the Greek Orthodox Church that's that's over there by Midtown and I grab a random person out there and I ask them for their definition of faith, what are they going to give me? How about if I go to the priest there? H how long would I have to talk to get into these ideas of levels? Maybe this is just how it goes in the Orthodox Church. I don't know. But Generally speaking, in terms of at least Protestant churches, faith is much more of a motivational trust. You know, pistis in the New Testament can reliably be translated believe or trust or faith. That's, that's sort of where it's sitting for most people in the pews. From the level, from that level, that is, it, it's faith if you take the elements of that level. Within those elements, it's always... So to, so to go back to Jonathan's example of the city, I have faith. I don't actually have a lot of faith in this. I have faith that the garbage will be collected. Today was garbage day in my neighborhood. I'm having issues with garbage here at church. So that's, that's, that's rattling my faith in the city. But, but that's, that's where sort of the psychological trust, belief connects up with Peugeot's levels. And again, when I first ran through this, it was like, hmm. And, and we'd been talking these levels so much. And it's like, I had to connect his levels with this pastoral trust, pistis, faith, belief. It's, it's a jump. It's a leap into another level of being. And so that is the, that is, you could say. And, and when he says leap, well, suddenly leap of faith, all these little things like. Uh. Say something, it's a leap into another level of being. And so that is the, that is, you could say something like the trust in things unseen, which is that if you're, if you're at a certain level, you can't see, you can't see above until you do that. And once you're there, then you see, but you can't see until you're, until you make that jump. Now, now they get the commercial, but the, so, so then again, back to the city, let's say I'm just a regular person in Sacramento and I pay for my garbage service. And maybe I find that big, that big can from the city to be unsightly. And well, I'll, I'll use 
um, green waste collection because this was an issue a few years ago in the city. The city decided that, with the exception of a few se a few seasons, usually fall with all the leaves, all green waste collection must happen in a bin. People in Sacramento didn't like that because for years we had the claw. And the claw, you'd see this truck with this big claw come down the street in a garbage can with it, boom, and you'd put its green waste into the into the garbage truck. Now the city quite reasonably was like, that's two drivers, that's that's fuel for two vehicles. That's if we can if we can containerize all the green waste. Just one garbage truck. It, it made a whole lot of sense for the city. Now, the city sends a note to me in, in my house and says, uh, the claw is going away. We'll, we'll have it for leaf season, but all green waste must be containerized. Like, well, I'd always just, when I'd, when I'd, I'd take my, the clippings from my lawnmower and it was so easy to just walk over to the street and bang, throw it in the street and walk away. Now I've got to take my big green container, open the lid, and let's say if I were shorter and less strong, oh, it's so heavy to get it up there and pour those those clippings into the green waste container and then roll the green waste container out. And so people, this makes no sense. Ah, trust the city. Well, well, it's it's in the city's best interest that we containerize the green waste. Yes. And it's in the city's best interest and your taxes will be lower. Oh, you mean if I want to keep just dumping it into the street, you're going to raise my taxes because you're paying two guys and two vehicles and fuel and maintenance and all of that versus one in the container for most of the year? Yeah. But that's the consciousness. And so to a certain degree, you trust... And then you basically have, this is where you get into like uh, physical versus narrative. Tell a little story about the budget and now suddenly, well, what do we say? It's easier for the city to containerize the green waste. What do you mean easy? It's harder for me to lift up the green waste and pour it into the bin the city doesn't have arms. What do you mean easy? Well, easy is very metaphorical. Easy is very narrative. You're almost thinking of the city as a large person for whom this is important work. A jump. Dark Horse has a new sponsor. The Oops. Got to jump ahead of the Dark Horse ad. Well, I have I have a good example to to test this out. Go for um, it. Depending upon how willing you are to step into the biology, <laughs> we'll see. It depends how complicated it is. We once did not know how information was. Notice the way he's setting this up. It's very much faith of the gaps, which hey, fair enough. Um, but that's that's again how he's understanding the word stored in a cell. So Darwin described the process by which information is refined by selection, but he didn't know where the information was stored. And there was, of course, a famous battle. Um, protein seemed a likely place where information could be stored. DNA seemed distinctly less likely because it had less variation to it. It was a, uh, a depauperate alphabet. But it turned out the DNA was the primary repository for information. We now know that the story is much more complex than this, but uh, to the extent that triplet codons described series of amino acids and those amino acids do the functional work of the cell. They make effectively machines inside the cell, enzymes that put together uh, atoms that might not uh, bind at normal energies. Otherwise, for example, we now know what brings the protein level and the informational level uh, together, right? So at one time, it would have been an article of faith. Okay, so so what's he describing? The protein level and the informational level. But now, uh, what brings the protein level and the informational level uh, together, right? So at one time, it would have been an article of faith, but now. 
Notice an article of faith. This is, no, notice how faith, the, the assumptions about what faith is. Well, faith is belief without evidence. Now, it is not. Whereas the story that we tell evolutionarily about um, most mutations are bad, changes in spelling in the DNA, occasionally one results in a change in a protein that's good those protein changes that are good accumulate because selection favors them and that changes the form of organisms and can ultimately uh, change something that has the form of a shrew into something that has the form of a bat right that story i would argue actually contains an article of faith that isn't true there's a missing layer of explanation that we scientists assume must be there. But I see there, there's the, and again, this is not this assumption. When I get on an airplane, I assume Southwest has done their job and is paying their mechanics. I assume the federal government is running the air traffic controller well. I assume I haven't checked out all of these things before I get on the airplane. I've seen other airplanes come and land and people have gotten off and it's like, well, maybe it's a maybe I can fly through the air on on with you know 250 other complete strangers in a massive thing, massive tube that weighs tons. Maybe I can. So again, it's not bad, but He's not talking about anything that Peugeot is talking about here. Actually isn't. We, there, there, there's something yeah. in the explanation that's just simply missing. So, but I think you're misunderstanding what I mean by, by faith or by the jump of level. All right. So let, let, let's take, let's take the, the DNA, for example. So you have, you have a bunch of stuff, right? I'm not a scientist. You have a bunch of stuff. You have a bunch of acids. You have a bunch of stuff that's there. And then, then all of a sudden you are able, because we're conscious beings, you're able to perceive a pattern. That pattern is repeated in different cells, but that pattern has an existence of its own because you can abstract it and you can model it. And so it doesn't only exist in the cells. It has, it has an invisible existence, a pattern, a pattern existence. And so that pattern is an unseen in the sense that it's not a bunch of stuff. It's a pattern of a bunch of stuff. Now that, that pattern, like I said, can be modeled. So, so now we're getting into sort of our upper and lower register. G-A-T-C is the pattern. It's not alphabets inside. It's the pattern of the nucleotides in the helix, in the DNA, in our cells. And so what, what, what Jonathan Peugeot is introducing is the upper register. It's, it's spirit to flesh. It's, it's mind to matter. It's heaven and earth. And there's an existence up here that is immaterial. Now he's using pattern, which is pattern, 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 what he always does. And, and, and consciousness participates up here. But the jump between the bunch of stuff and the pattern, that is what I talk about when I say faith. That is because it's the same at every level of being. Like I'm using the lowest level, but it, it, it's, sometimes it's harder for people to see it at that level. But it's a lot easier if you move up to things like cities and families and, and, and let's say uh, troops of armies or all of these things where all of a sudden you see a structured cohesion of beings that come together into a pattern. But that pattern, like I said, is it can is uh, is invisible because it it can be modeled and then reproduced. It has all this type of and and I'm I wish he hadn't used invisible. And again, I'm not critiquing because you're in the middle of a conversation. You use the word that pops up. The pattern is immaterial. I mean he, I mean he could be talking. It's it's like a form, or it's like the the Aristotelian formal cause. Of, 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 of has these types of qualities. So I'm, basically I'm arguing for the existence of patterns and that's ultimately where I'm, I'm not, I don't want to hide it from you. That's where I'm bringing you to what religion is, is that it's the patterning of being. All right. So we are clearly in the phase where we have to teach each other our language in order to have a conversation. <laughs> I fully agree that 
there are patterns. In fact, I have argued and will argue that the only thing that is amenable to study is patterns. That's what we study. Um, and that these patterns exist at different levels, right? I would call, and I've heard you use the term, so I, uh, I know we at least have a shared term here. The jump between levels is emergence. Emergence can be uh, one of these articles of faith that I describe where we cannot explain why the properties of the higher level uh, are viewed based on the properties of what exists at the levels below it. So we're tracking here well. This is going well. Right. So yeah, now we're on the same. Now we're in the same direction. Definitely. Now we're in the same direction. So and I would understand and, you know, I'm not uh, I'm very interested in the philosophy of science, but I'm not a philosopher of science. But uh, I take it that there are two ways of understanding emergence. There are those the strong emergentists who believe that there is no you, you cannot explain uh, the jump in emergence between many different levels. I would describe myself as a weak emergentist, which is to say I believe that uh, you, we may never have the computing power to do it, but that in principle, everything at the higher levels ought to be explainable by the properties of things at the lower levels. If Okay, and there's, of course, his, what, what he might regard as faith. Because that article is, of course, something that cannot be proven or disproven. That would be more or less his presupposition. If you comprehend it well enough, um, you know, is there a, a discontinuity at the very bottom, you know, original cause, something like that? I think I have to leave that possibility open. But in general, there shouldn't be um, irreducible uh, levels of emergence at, at higher uh, higher stages of explanation, but all right. So let's let's try to figure out now. Now, for those of you who've been following along in this little corner, of course, you're saying, "Well, you've got emergence and you've got emanation," and what Peugeot has really been talking about is much more emanation than emergence. Where we've landed. Right. Let's take maybe I, I, I can add maybe something to help you. So just so that Good. we're not so that I don't we don't lose ourselves. So the manner in which I try to describe to describe it is a two way process. That is, I, I understand why scientists and materialists, they like to talk about emergence bottom up. But I think that talking about emergence bottom up will always lead you into to some it will lead you into some problems. And so the, let's say the te the normal religious point of view would be that there's there's something, are you, we use the word emanation, we could use other words. There's an emanation from the pattern and there's emergence from the constituents. And so there's, there's a causality of pattern. That is, patterns are causal. They, 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 affect, they affect order. And so we can, it's, it's hard to see, like I said, in biologic, I think it's still true, but it's easier to see in human structures. Whereas you have a military captain that orders and that order goes down the order of, of causality and creates action in the men that are digging trenches or that are doing whatever they're doing. And so, but that wouldn't be possible without the emergent principle of these men together with a single, with a common purpose that are bound by this hierarchy into, into action. And so there, there's a top down, there's a top down causality, which is different than the bottom up causality, but those two, those two come together. And that's what Anyway, it's, it's important because when we get to rituals and when we get to to uh, to uh, let's say uh, hygiene laws, it's going to be important to, to understand that because it 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 feeds into why those things are important. Now, now, one of the things that's really helpful to think about at this point is implicit in materialist dogma is an implicit observer within a chronological timeline, okay? Because the idea is that, well, first you have this explosion, and then, and of course, they have trouble thinking about what today we call laws of physics or laws of nature that dictate the way in which 
the 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 imaginary observer begins to watch a process of organization from what to us feels because when we think explosion we think chaos big bang things begin to coalesce and to order because the if you will one way to think about it would be that the gravitation all of the physics that then operates upon the chaotic matter that has exploded out into the universe operates on that matter and makes turns it in informs it bringing it into forms out of which we begin to see information, okay? And the materialist conception is that all of this is just happening, and in many ways, these laws of physics are God because they are bringing order out of chaos. Now, I just today have been watching the John Verveke, Rick Rapetti video that someone referenced in the comment section to this one. Um, which which is it's is a video I'm I'm very much enjoying. I, in fact, I took a little I took a little clip out of it. Maybe I'll just play the clip. Right, that you know there is you know Newtonian billiard ball type atoms and whatnot, and then there's life, and then there's mind. You know, yeah. so like, you've got locom you've got locomotory organisms, locomotion that that can move themselves as opposed to ones that can't. Right, every single step in the evolutionary trajectory involves some new abilities that weren't there before. So all these emergent properties that seem to be, and that's this autopoiesis thing that I hear you talking about all the time, self-organizing systems yes. that at, at, when they reach a new level of organization, they have self-regulating abilities that previous iterations in the causal stream that led to them lacked. You know, And it doesn't mean that these things are supernatural or anything. They're not inconsistent with the laws of the universe. You know, um, so but, like, just, but yeah. there are real differences there. There are yeah. real differences. Yeah. There's real Absolutely. difference between a rock and a paramecium, and there's real difference between a paramecium and a fish, and between a fish and a primate, and a primate and a person. Like, there are right. real differences there. Exactly. And this argument does not take any of that ontological. Right. Right? No. Uh, uh, That's uh, that simplification of propositions. Yes. The, what did Wittgenstein say? S caught in the grip of a view. Yes, right. yes, yes. So this kind of analytic, propositional, deductive argument thing with premises about determinism, that's very, very blinders involving. It rules out and ignores all this other complexity. And I have a friend who criticizes me whenever I say complexity. He says, okay, so your art, he's got that determinism, therefore no free will thing in his mind. He says, okay, so you've got the laws of nature, you've got initial conditions, and then complexity, poof, free will. And I'm like, no, no it's no. not just poof, free will. It's a very, very complicated thing. There's different kinds of causality. Yes, exactly. exactly. Billiard ball causality is not the same from even tropistic plant causality, yeah. yes. which is different from locomotory animals that have sensory motor feedback mechanisms. And the preponderance of the self-organization within an entity also increases both quantitatively how much it is part of what it is to be that thing, and also qualitatively how, how, how recursive and how many feedback loops there are within the self-organization. Like, right. like it, it, it's, it's, I mean, the whole proposal of autopoiesis is that one of the essential features of life is that life is self-making. That's what autopoiesis make. Now, it doesn't mean absolutely self-making the way Aristotle's unmoved mover is or God, the uh, Christian God, is creation ex nihilo, but it does mean like you, you can't, uh, the, the, the proposal is you can't explain, for example, evolution unless you give life particular properties that non-living things don't have. And the way you explain those is because life is a self-making thing in and it 
has to take care of itself in a it's way. It's got homeostasis. Yep, yep, yep. All living things are homeostatic, right? So one of the terms that I used in my, in my dissertation and in my first book on this was largely based on my dissertation was a, a term I might, I don't know if I, it's a neologism of mine, but it's a term that I used called uh, autotelic as in teleology. Yes. We, we can generate new ends for ourselves. Yes, yes, yes. This is something that other species can't do. We can redesign our volitional structures. Yes. Well, that takes me to aspiration. So, yeah. so I want to say three things. Another, I want to do another analogy. Um, so part of the problem I've always had with Strassen's argument um, is, is, is I take it a, 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 as, a, as a, a, a reductio, a, a modus tollens on the framing. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, so uh, uh, this was an argument that Cohen and other people made in the 1980s. We were using these logical standards uh, for judging whether or not people were rational. And then it turns out that that algorithmic standard can't actually be met by any fine, finite information processing being for combinatorial explosion. And so especially what Cherniak was arguing is saying, look, look, it's not that people lack rationality. It's that you've used a logical standard that makes it impossible for any finite being to be rational, right? And so when, when I hear arguments that, you know, you know why you don't have free will? Because you're not an unmoved mover uh, completely cause a sweet thing. I go, what? Well, <laughs> how did that standard get to be the standard? Like, like what is it in the in your presuppositions and intuition uh, that makes that like again, other than our Christian uh, heritage? Like, why? How? Like, why set that? Why make that the standard for the application of the term freedom? Uh, so that's a, another analogy. It's like maybe we're using the wrong kind of normative theory uh, and and drawing the wrong kinds of uh, descriptive conclusions from it. And then the, the other thing is, you know, what, what, what you've been talking about, autotelic is, by the way, it's used by uh, uh, Csikszentmihalyi in his oh. description of the flow state. It's an autotelic oh, cool. state. Um, so I got uh, it from him because I certainly read that book when it came out. I've read it a few times, yeah. Well, and, and, and that, that, that's, again, sort of another thing I wanted to bring up. Not only, I mean, and you're already challenging it with the descriptions of causation. I mean, a lot of the arguments presuppose a Newtonian linear billiard ball model of causation. Um, they fail to take into account the combinatorial explosion that faced in any account of causation, even between inanimate objects. This is an old problem, but it, it doesn't seem like, when I ask you what caused the sinking of the Titanic, you will give me different answers depending on what is relevant to the question at hand. You may say it hit an iceberg. You may say the British were competing with Americans for the dominance of the shipping lanes. You may say the ice age that actually produced the, like you can say the temperature of the water. You could say uh, British industry at that time had impurities in the steel. And that, mean, that meant that the steel couldn't withstand, like, right? And, and the point is, and this is something that Dan Chiappi and I argued a long time, is we never we can never give the cause because that the, the the cause of something right neutrally is the entire previous history of the universe which means science would fall prey to this problem if we use that standard well you can't tell me you can't tell me that this virus causes corona right it, it causes all the disease because you know it's actually blah, blah, blah. What we're actually doing in science is we're talking about causal relevance. Which, what are the most causally relevant factors for the problem we're trying to address? Right, right. Okay. Yeah, Caesar's crossing the Rubicon or not has nothing to do with COVID, even though this, the, 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 this hard determinist argument, by the yeah. way. Yeah. It, let, let me. Let... So the causal relevance, and that's that's really where I wanted to where I wanted to get in that, because that's actually pretty critical in terms of this conversation because of, well, genetics certainly is a piece of the puzzle. And genetics is a huge piece for Brett in terms of his religion, which we'll get at to at about one hour, two minutes. 
Okay, so let me use an example here, which uh, it does double duty. Um, in my field, I believe my colleagues have been slow to understand the Darwinian nature of religious belief and religious faith because... Okay, before we go to this, I want to get back to this causal section and I want to jump to a different podcast. I played a considerable amount of Michael Levin's appearance on The Theory of Everything with Kurt Jermungle, where he talks about flatworms and he talks about the function that electricity plays. And he's basically pushing back against the argument that genetics is the determinative relative frame for interpreting the evolution and performance of life. And so I, I played a fair amount of that video in this video of mine, how might, how might flatworms know their shape and how might we know the hand of God? And that video very much talked about levels. After I played that video, as is the wonderful thing about having a YouTube channel that really lovely people watch and post really helpful comments in the comment section. Sorry, I can't see all of the comments, but um, someone post, someone pointed me to this podcast where Michael Levin was on with Vance Crow, where they actually talk about these layers and levels of cognition, which actually have everything to do with what Peugeot is talking about when he's talking about faith. It strikes me as you're describing this as um, I remember when uh, the panic began about losing antibiotics, right? And it was like, once we lose antibiotics, there's nothing left. And then if you go out and kind of explore science, you find out, oh, well, there's phage research. Maybe that will come up. But this is a, a different paradigm of medicine for me. This is not something I've ever even considered before. Where else do you think this applies? How do you think people should understand the future growth of, of electroceuticals? Yeah, um, I, I think you're right. I think I think it is a new a new uh, a new domain and a new way of, of addressing this for for two reasons. First, uh, let's well maybe I should show a little bit of the Germungle conversation where basically he changes the the what what they're doing is oh boy how much of this am I going to play. Um, before 1900 so so it certainly has occurred to people that maybe electrical signals are important in development regeneration all, all of my work i was i was incredibly um heavily inspired by by work that was done in this in the 60s 70s and 80s by by a bunch of people that worked really hard on this stuff the reason that it hadn't gone far enough was two two, two reasons number one the tools weren't there. So these dyes didn't exist. All they had was traditional mm. electrophysiology. Okay. In traditional electrophysiology, you have one electrode and you're poking it into cells. And if you want to have a picture of what's going on, you got to poke all the cells. And that's just completely Im Im impractical, right? These, these dyes didn't exist. The conceptual thing was that um, around the time that this stuff was, was taking off using, using electrodes and things like that, uh, biochemistry and molecular biology took off. And the thing, the, th the reason molecular biology drew all the attention is because you could do molecular biology and biochemistry in dead fixed tissue. So you can, you can kill and fix your cells and you can sequence the DNA. You can sequence the RNA. You can get a proteome. You can get a, uh, you know, all of these, all of these kinds of things you can do. None of that is possible with bioelectrics. So the minute your cell is dead, all of it goes away. So none mm -hmm. of the typical omics approaches work. So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's that much harder. And so it really lagged behind because all the interest went into the molecular, uh, you know, kind of molecular biochemistry mm -hmm. and, uh, and it had to wait for some of these tools to, to come up. The third thing, the third thing is, is that I think while, while people did, uh, think about, uh, the, the importance of these bioelectric gradients, nobody to my knowledge uh be before we did it really thought about it as the beginnings of the nervous system and to really put that computational spin on it the, the fact that this thing really is like a neural network doing computations about development i i think that's new i i will say um harold burr 
who was this guy was working in the 30s, 1930s, 40s, and 50s, okay? He had one of the first good voltmeters around, and he went around measuring things, you know, uh, elm trees and rabbits and tumors and, and embryos and all kinds of stuff. On the basis of this, he wrote an amazing book um, that basically said most of the things that we're discovering now. The guy had a crystal ball. It's incredible. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So he, he could clearly see a lot of this stuff. The, thing, the, the one thing he did not see, because at the time it didn't exist, was the computational aspects and, the, and the really the link to, um, you know, to, to, to this as, as a kind of neuroscience done in another space, in morphous space. That, I think, is, is new. But, but uh, people had already had these ideas, and it needed... The technology to really make it to really prove them out and to really see how it works i'll be showing people some overlays of some of the cells with the blue and green and red voltage colors now voltage is actually fairly abstract for most people but what's not abstract is something like an electron people can fathom that that has a certain charge so when someone is looking at these videos of voltage gradients and they're colored what is one seeing Essentially, I'm asking you to explain what voltage is simply, but in terms of electrons, in terms of something that people can understand. Yeah. In order to understand voltage, you have to understand potential and you also have to understand fields technically if you want to understand that correctly. Yeah, um, it's not so bad. You don't need to really do much with fields in this one at all because, because all of the things that I'm talking about are really not fundamentally fields per se. They're just spatial distributions of voltage gradients. And, and to understand a voltage gradient, it's, it's pretty simple. Instead of electrons, life, I mean, life uses electrons too, but mostly the kinds of the stuff that we're talking about uses a different charged particle. They use uh, uh, potassium, chloride, sodium, and protons. Okay, but otherwise, same, same deal. And so any cell has a cell membrane around it, the outer surface, and it has these ion channels, which are these little portals, these little proteins that can open and close and let specific ions like potassium or sodium in and out. These potassium, you know, so potassium and sodium are both positively charged. So you can imagine that if you, if you're a cell and you let a bunch of your pot uh, positively charged potassiums out, you can have an imbalance, more positives out here, less positives inside. So now there's going to be a voltage gradient, a ba basically a battery in effect. I mean, that's basically what a battery is, right? It's a, it's a membrane with a, with a charge disbalance on, across it. That's, that's all this is. So every cell is a battery. It achieves that by using energy to pump ions in a particular direction. And as a result, you, if you were to take a tiny little voltmeter and put it across, and people, that's exactly what electrophysiologists do, you put it across that cell membrane, you're going to read a voltage of some sort. You know, it's usually somewhere between... I don't know, between 20 millivolts and, 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 and 70 millivolts, something like that, right? That's all it is. And so now you imagine doing that for every cell in the tissue that you're looking at, and you're just going to color every cell depending on how big that voltage difference is. It's, you're going to color it red if the voltage difference is quite small. That's called being depolarized, meaning there's just not that much imbalance. It's pretty much, it's quite similar. You know, the ions inside and outside are pretty similar. So you're going to co color those red. And then the ones that are really different where there's a ton of uh, uh, positive charges that have been kicked out, so the cell is really pretty negative, that compared to the outside space, that you're going to color those, uh, you're going to color those blue. Now, now, now notice we're, we're talking about relevance, scientific relevance here. We're not talking about the GATC in the cell. We're talking about the electrical. And we're talking about the potassium and the sodium and the difference, creating something like a tiny little battery and a little cell and how that spreads out over the, over the, um, the tissue. And, of course, those of you who have seen this before know that what they've discovered is that this is, this is tremendously formative. Uh, we he talked about taking a cancer cell, uh, making it non-cancerous. And, of course, cancer basically is, you know, is often talking about, you know, a mutation. That's not a mutation. It's the electrical. So, so you've got two different systems. Now, often when we talk about layers, we sort of stack them up because stacking is very visual for us. It's very, you know, we can understand a stack. But obviously we're dealing in much more of a three-dimensional space here. It isn't necessarily X, Y, uh, you've got X, Y, Z, and it's all over because, in fact, if you were supposed to, if you wanted to visualize the relationships between the GATC and the genes versus the electroceuticals, well, they're obviously not disconnected, 
but they're they're obviously not necessarily just simply stacked. They're they have a relationship, and where I certainly have no idea how to map them. But then he goes through the the Xenobots, how he how he creates. Question was the the question that we're interested in addressing is is basically this. Um, where do anatomical goals come from? And in order to illustrate why that's even a good question, I want to talk about planaria for just a moment, and then and then you'll see why this this is important for the xenobots. Um, we we are we are used to the fact that uh, each species has a specific shape that is associated with it, and that frog eggs make frogs, and 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 zebrafish eggs make zebrafish, and so on. So we're we're kind of we're kind of used to that, but the actual question of how do cellular collectives decide what they're going to build and when do they stop building? That, that's very much an open question. And so, so one way you can see how, how far we are away from a good understanding of this is in, in a very simple, um, very simple experiment. Uh, there are, there are round, so, so planaria are these flatworms that regenerate. When you cut them into pieces, every piece builds whatever is missing and they regenerate. Okay, that's, that's planaria. You can cut them into pieces and they, they, every piece regenerates to a normal planarian. So there are species of planaria that have round heads, and those, type, those cells are really good at building a round head and then stopping. So they stop when a round head is complete. Okay. Then you got another species of planaria that has a very pointy head, a tri- kind of a triangular head. And those cells are very good at, po- at making a triangular head. When you cut it off, it makes a triangular head, and then it stops. So now I have a simple question. If I take a bunch of the cells from the round-headed guy, and I stick them into the body of the triangular guy, and I let them sort of get a, you know get comfortable and sit around for a little while. And then I cut the head. In other words, he's mixing up the genetic data. All right. Head off. What head shape are we going to have? Are we going to have is one of the head shapes dominant to the other? Are we going to have a, an intermediate shape, or are we going to have a planarian that never stops regenerating because neither set of cells is ever happy about the shape? They're never that stop condition is never set. Okay, so now, so now, look. The, the important thing is not the answer. The, the, the important thing is, despite all of the uh, papers in Nature and Science about the molecular pathways of control of stem cells in planaria and all all these kinds of high resolution transcriptomics and all this stuff. There is not a single model in the field that makes a prediction on this experiment. Why? Because every piece of data out there now addresses the hardware that enables individual cells to do cell things. Fine. Okay, the hardware. That's a layer. Fine. But we have no understanding of what happens when the cells join together into a larger scale self that makes large scale decisions about head shape, head number, things like that in morphous space that navigates morphous space by making these large scale decisions. We have the large scale. This is a different layer. Absolutely no idea how those algorithms work. And the fact that we know how the stem cells work and, and have lots of molecular biology about that really hasn't affected this other question much at all. We, we, we just have no, no models for this. Because it's too computationally complex or for some other in principle reason? I don't think it's, well, no, I don't think it's because it's too complex, although it is too complex to calculate out directly. I think it's because... So in other words, faith. Conceptually, we haven't found the right, uh, we haven't found the right way to think about how cellular collectives make decisions. This is, this is a collective... Did you hear that? how cellular collectives make decisions. That cellular collective has a spirit. Now, again, unless we're going to be panpsychists all the way down and have all these tiny little consciousness that, that, that someone, they went to little, they went to little cell consciousness school and said, not nah, you have a, you have a round head, you have a pointy head. Uh, no, we don't want to go there. How do they make decisions decisions you're talking volition do they have volition well again we we're our panpsychist language is panpsychist all the way down and i'm not a panpsychist so what why are we using the word volition because there are choices going on here active intelligence problems is not a molecular biology problem we've ah. been thinking of vision, right? 
uh, we haven't found the right way to think about how cellular collectives make decisions. This is this is a collective intelligence problem. This is not a molecular biology problem. We've ah. been thinking about this as a molecular biology problem. That's not what this is. This is this is trying to read the mind of a collective intelligence. Now, people think of collective intelligences as exotic things like ant hills and and you know bee, bee colonies and things like this. These are collective intelligences. Um, I want to remind everybody that we are all collective intelligences. We are all bags of cells. He is singing Peugeot's song. No, there is no cognitive agent that is like this single diamond that's that's not made mm -hmm. of parts. That's you know, mm -hmm. sort of unchanging. We're all made of parts. Any cognitive agent is made of parts. And so your goal is to ask, how do those parts bind together to make decisions as a collective? Individual cells don't know what a head is. They don't know what round round means. They don't know what triangular means. The individual cells are at a different layer. They're the apple as opposed to the tree or the orchard. Right. But the collective sure does. And so the collective is able to navigate morphospace space in this way that we don't understand the algorithm. So if we don't even we don't even know how to um, how to think about this. OK. I just know it's easy to dump my green waste in the street. But the city knows things that I don't know. And the city, well, mayors come and go. Uh, city managers come and go. City council people come and go. Uh, solid waste director of the solid waste division comes and goes. But the city knows something that the pieces don't know. Again, this is what Peugeot is talking about. So um, so 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 this this is very isomorphic to problems in neuroscience, to problems in in artificial intelligence. It's uh, trying to understand the scaling of of minds and in, in trying to do that, we, we pose the following problem. Okay, standard tadpoles make, you know, standard frog eggs make, make, make frog embryos, and everybody's kind of used to that, even, even though, you know, you can remind, I, I always remind my students, did you realize that, that if I gave you the frog genome, you couldn't tell me what a frog looked like, right? If I gave you the frog genome, you couldn't say what a frog looked like. That's the point. The genome doesn't know the frog. The frog is some ways sort of, it's a, it's, the frog is clearly a collective. But where is that pattern stored? Where does that pattern come from? You, you could compare it to other genomes that yeah. you did know, what, but that, well, that's cheating. You know, you, so, 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 okay, so we asked, the, we asked a simple question. Where does the goal of making a frog or tadpole really come from? And how hardwired is that? So what we did was we took some skin uh, that we scraped off of an early frog embryo. We, we set it aside in a different environment. And we said, okay, now you're free to sort of reboot your multicellularity. You're here. We've, we've, we've relieved all of the constraints of the rest of the embryo. You're no longer getting instructive signals from, from, from endoderm and from mesoderm and from all these other things. You're no longer subject to all these other signals. What are you going to do? What, 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 what's, what's your new, what, you know, what, 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 do, what do you want to do? And there's a, where's, where's your tell us? Off and, and sort of went each cell go its own way. They could. A, a little mistake there. Thank you. We lost some of what he said. Cellularity. You're here. We've, we've, we've relieved all of the constraints of the rest of the embryo. You're no longer getting instructive signals from, from, from endoderm and from mesoderm and from all these other things. You're no longer subject to all these other signals. What are you going to do? What, 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 what's, what's your new, what, you know, what, 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 do, what do you want to do? And there's a couple of different options that could have happened. The cells could have died. They could have wandered off and, and sort of went each cell go its own way. They could have made a monolayer of cells in a dish the way you get in cell culture. All kinds of things they could have done. They didn't do any of that. What they did instead was to combine together and to form a little ball that grew cilia, these little moti. Now, if you're just listening, you're really missing out because it is really freaky watching the frog skin cells become, they're not a person, become a cognitive intelligence. Style hairs on the outer surface. Now, Cilia are normally sitting on the outside of embryos and they're there to kind of redistribute the mucus around and to, you know, make the pathogens sort of keep moving and not stick to the skin. They're used to, they're, they're used to, um, 
and keep the surface of the of the tadpole clean. Uh, but instead, these cells basically repurposed that genetically encoded hardware. The cilia themselves are genetically encoded. All the proteins necessary to make a cilium are in the genome, they, and they, they so so they have that already. But what they did was they assembled themselves into a new um, into a new kind of uh, a new kind of architecture. This this the spherical thing, which and and then and then they used the cilia to propel themselves. So they started running around. They started moving around, and so we have these amazing videos of them moving around singly, moving around in groups, interacting, do, going through a maze, uh, going back and forth in various... Uh... They had a little maypole, and, and they, they built a little building, and they sang songs. Uh, configurations. They have all kinds of behaviors. They, have all kind, they, they can regenerate. If you, if you cut them almost entirely in half, they will like join back and, and, and make a, you know, make a, uh, uh, make, make a, make a, a xenobot again. And the, the the and 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 so and so the coolest thing about them is and and by the way we don't we don't know their cognitive capacities yet okay we don't we we we're only beginning now to start to see can they they have cognitive capacities they learn can they do they have preferences all these kinds of things we don't know yet but the can they fill out forms can they spy on the Russians the coolest thing about them is that to my knowledge they're the only creature on the planet that doesn't really have an evolutionary backstory. The individual cells do, okay? The cells have a long evolutionary history on Earth, but they don't have a lineage. Now that word, as we get into this conversation, is gonna be really important because we're gonna see lineages in religion and we're gonna see groups in religion. These little xenobots don't have a lineage. But they were selected for, that genome was selected for the ability of these cells to sit quietly on the outside of the frog and keep out the pathogens. They were not selected specifically to be able to get together and run around in a separate, in a separate configuration away from the embryo. Where did that all come from? And in fact, one of the, one of the things about it is people, people often say, well, you know, when are you going to buy, when are you going to engineer these things, you know, knock in various uh, synthetic biology circuits, right? Make them do things. And we absolutely will do that. But my goal before we do any of that, my goal was to show people what what can happen, while well, the diversity that can happen from the exact same genome with no manipulations whatsoever. Okay. So the genetics. Now, now Brent wants to say, well, genetics, gene, 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 it's just says pattern, pattern, pattern. Genetics are one, let's call it a frame. They're one way in. You know, Verveke's like, well, what sunk the Titanic? Well, steel. Well, well, poor steel quality. And I remember watching a documentary on TV about steel and blah, 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 blah. And it's the speed and it's the it's the person that said, you know, hey, there's icebergs in the water. Yeah, this is the Titanic, full steam ahead. And, you know, what sunk the Titanic? Well, genes are a piece, but now Peugeot is, is obviously working on, you know, He's saying, well, it's the relationships that are what we're talking about. And faith is faith is the the trust in the upper levels. It's like, oh, it's not the sight because you can't see. And so when Brett says, well, it used to be faith, but no, he's talking about something very different. So so after you know, after the sperm and the egg come together, you have your genetic material. You've got your GATCs. They're all in there. And and that isn't going to change mutations, blah, 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 blah. But so basically Levin's arg argument is that the, it's these electroceuticals and you can, you, you ought to be able to grow things back. Uh, regeneration. So electroceuticals are, are the pharmaceuticals are just chemicals. The electroceuticals are we're going to manipulate the, because this electricity is, it's the same stuff in terms of your thought. And it's suddenly like, oh my goodness. Well, 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 if, 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 if watching PVK on a screen and listening to sounds moves electrical signals in my brain and in fact my whole body is being ordered and cancer or no cancer because these electrical signals oh boy uh, uh, suddenly 
I used to think of myself as a sack of chemicals. Now, I'm almost in the matrix. Now I think of myself as a, as a network of bioelectric signals. But again, back to all the kinds of things. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hardly, PVK isn't just sort of enclosed in this skin. There's all these representations of PVK and his voice and his picture and his thoughts and his ideas. And, and, you know, some of me is in my children and some of me is in my congregation and my father and my grandfather and all of them are in me. And, and, and we're, when, again, we get further into this and we talk about lineage and, and when Brett Weinstein, in terms of his religion is trying to save us, it's like, well, what is us? You're not talking the chemicals. Remember Peugeot? You're talking the pattern. I am much more a pattern than a sack of chemicals because um, the the conversation with uh, John Verveke and Rick Rapetti, you know, went, went all the way back to Augustine because they're talking, well, Augustine lives, Augustine is living between them in a way. Well, what do you mean living? Well, the pattern of Augustine and, and the pattern of Pelagius and the pattern of their conversation, the spirit of their conversation, continues to echo. And so, 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 what exactly, what exactly are we talking about? What am I? Now, now I want to get to the um, the podcast because now you've got a better introduction to what these electroceuticals are and what they're talking about. Uh, let's just talk about areas of application. So realize that in medicine, almost everything except for infectious disease. So other than infectious disease, almost every other problem would be solved if we knew how collections of cells make decisions about what they're going to build. So birth defects, traumatic injury, uh, reprogramming tumors, uh, degenerative disease, aging, all of these things would be solved if we knew how to take a group of cells and say, you're going to be a normal heart or you're going to be a liver, or uh, you're short a finger, you're going to need an extra finger. If we knew how to communicate those anatomical goals to cells, which, which means basic research to understand how that's uh, decided in the first place during embryonic development, if we knew how to do that, um, massive uh, areas of medicine would be solved. And I see future regenerative medicine as really providing a uh, a, a fundamental solution to all of these things, you know, whatever, whether cells are, con, uh, are, are um, whether tissues are damaged from, from uh, injury or they're never there in the first place because of a birth defect or they're old, whatever it is, if we knew how to communicate to those cells, here's, here's what you need to be building, uh, this would be a transformation in medicine. So that's, that's the first thing. And, and how we're going to do that, I think, is in large part going to be bioelectrical because the decisions that those cells are, are making together are mediated by a kind of um, bioelectrical uh, communication that's like the glue that binds them together. Okay, now we should have a little bit of humility here because a generation ago, uh, it was all going to be genetics. We've discovered genetics and and we can, you know, we've got the splicer and we can we can do all this genetic stuff and genetic medicine and genetics, genetics, genetics. And now it's going to be, maybe the next wave is going to be electroceuticals and will there be a wave after that? I mean, we don't seem to be lacking waves, but Again, the, my point here isn't, this is a video about electroceuticals, this is a video about layers. That, that all of these layers are interacting and the different layers are, are in a sense epistemologically siloed. And it's the translation between the layers that is really interesting. Again, back to the Iowa cornfield. What does the corn know of the dog? What does the dog know of the farmer. What does the farmer know of the um, guild or the, far, the, the cooperative or the market or the state? I mean, you begin unfolding this and you begin to see, oh my goodness, there's layers all over the place. And we, we, we thought the corn was complex and the, because of course the corn goes down into other layers. It, it sounds, you know, it sounds weird and everything, but but realize that that's basically what what neuroscience has been saying all along, right? How do we arise? You know, you and I have this like centralized perspective. We feel like a like a separate individual, but we're a collection of neurons, really. And so, how is it that this collection of cells, this collection of neural cells, can have memories, goals, preferences uh, that don't belong to any of the cell individually? It belongs to the collective. So, 
all cells do this, not just neurons in your brain, all cells do this. It's just that the rest of the cells in your body are thinking about shape and physiology, not behavior. That's, that's the only difference. So um, I think much as we communicate with each other with signals that ultimately turn into electrical signals, right? Things you see, things you smell, you hear, you taste, all of those things come into the brain as electrical uh, media. Then the exact same thing happens to the rest of the tissue. We can communicate with them electrically. And uh, hopefully if we know what we're saying, if we understand the, 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 the code, we can get them to do various things. The other, the other thing that's going to be fundamentally different, I hope, is that right now, almost with, with the exception of antibiotics and surgery, most of the medical uh, interventions that we have don't actually solve anything. They don't fix anything. They address, uh, they address symptoms. And as long as you keep taking them, the, hopefully the symptoms are reduced and hopefully the side effects aren't too bad, um, which is, although that's a major problem, of course. And if you were to stop taking them, you go right back to where you were because these things don't actually repair anything, right? And so I think that what's, what's really important is, is going to be to take advantage of the learning, um, the intelligence of cellular collectives to really push them into a health state, not to try to micromanage it, not to, not to try to be there with your drug 24 seven to sort of force at the, at the very end, you know, sort of force the, the outcome that you want, but to, to move the whole system into, uh, into a place where the whole dynamic is different and you're not there all the time having to, having to push it. I think that's going to be, uh, for reasons we can ex explore if you want, that's, that's going to um, really help with the whole side effects issue. And it's going to be much more powerful. And, and this, this will all be bioelectrics is w a, a key way to do that. There may well be others. I don't know. There may well be other ways. Now, when you imagine, and I'd like to explore the, the more deeply, but when you imagine detecting what's going on with somebody's bioelectric signals, are you imagining, hey, we cut you open and then we put these um, connectors on there to, to check the wattage? Are you imagining? Uh, I, I mean, I can't even I can't even wrap my mind around how do you even check the the these things that you're thinking about repairing using electroceuticals? Yeah. So so the way we do it now in our model systems is with uh, something that are that's called a voltage sensitive fluorescent dye. So these are these are chemicals that you can bathe. So let's say you have a frog embryo and you would like to know when the frog embryo um, makes a decision as to how big the brain is going to be, right? What are the electrical states that tell you where the edges of the brain need to be? In fact, that, that's a thing. Um, that's, a, that's how the brain decides how big it's supposed to be. Um, so, so what you can do is you can soak it in the solution of this dye. And this dye has this amazing property that it fluoresces, which you can see on a camera, with different wavelengths and different brightness, depending on uh, what the local voltage potential is. So at every cell, so what it does is it, it, it temporarily um, goes into the cell membrane that covers every cell. And depending on the voltage around that membrane, and this is what we're trying to track are these patterns of voltages, it will release light. And we capture that light with a camera. So we literally have, and you can see this in our, in the supplements to our papers, or you can see this in the, in the Ted talk, we have videos. You can take movies of this stuff. You can, you can literally see all the electrical conversations that cells are having with each other. And you can see that changing over time. Now, how is that going to work uh, in, in humans? So, so the big limitation of this technology right now is that it's purely optical, meaning that if you can see it, that's great. But beyond the first three or four level, layers of cells, you can't see down there. It's opaque. So, so with a human, uh, you're not going to be able to see too far down. Now, certain things, for example, uh, diagnostics for skin cancer, let's say on the surface of your skin and the oral mucosa, things like that, that that's, that's already solvable now. Um, and we have some, some thoughts around that. Uh, things like tracking bioelectric states when you're doing surgery to remove a tumor so you can see where the edges, you know, the tumor margins, how much do you need to take out, right? That, that's right there and open to the, to the, um, to the surgeon, so you should, be able to, you should be able to do that. As far as the rest of it, I think the rest of the body, I think we're going to have to wait for uh, the development of better reagents that report not in uh, the visual uh, you know, uh, dimension, but maybe, maybe some sort of ultrasound reagent that, that gives you different ultrasound signals based on the voltage or maybe um, uh, you know, some sort of uh, tomography or something like that. These are, these are coming, They're already, there's chemists already working on this stuff. But there's another really interesting thing that I should mention, which is this idea of surrogate site diagnostics. So one thing we, we noticed, uh, and this was actually the work of, uh, of an undergrad uh, in, the, in the lab, Sierra Busi, and uh, she, she noticed that when you have a, we have a froglet and if that froglet uh, loses one of the hind legs, the opposite leg, if any are tracking voltage during this whole process, the opposite leg lights up in exactly the same location where the other leg got injured. 
So you can tell what's going on in the opposite leg by tracking the voltage in the intact leg. Okay, and this is this is not the first time we've seen this because there are we we've we've have a number of papers showing that you know whether you get a tumor on one side one part of the body or or um, whether the organs are shaped correctly is in part um, a function of voltage all the way across the other side of the body. Meaning, again, not terribly surprising. Electrical networks share information. That's what electrical networks are for. So so part of the, the, what this network is doing is letting all, m many and maybe all I don't know cells within the body know what's going on at distant locations. Okay, it's an integrated system. So that means that maybe someday, if you want to know what's going on in one area of the body, you can look somewhere else, somewhere that's easier to, to check. So maybe if you've got a region on your body that's really easy to get voltage imaging from, maybe maybe you know inside the mouth, maybe the tongue, maybe in the eye, who knows? Maybe you can extract from that electrical um, uh, map information that will tell you what's going on elsewhere that may be really hard to uh, really hard to get to so that that kind of surrogate um, you know that kind of surrogate diagnostic so so obviously everything we've done is in the frog uh, I you know I'm not saying by any means that this already works in humans or that we're ready to do it in humans we're not but fundamentally I think that information about health and disease is present throughout the body and I'm sure we can there, there can be clever ways of, of getting that without cutting anybody open you know, with this being something that uh, is so new, or at least new to people like me, I, I always think about um, when people are describing medicine from back in, say, the Middle Ages, right, where they're like, oh, there are the four humors, and we kind of mock them for being so yeah. silly and so simple-minded. But you have to wonder if all of the television shows that have ever been made about uh, medicine will look rather silly when they weren't considering the the like the electric charge going on inside of organs or inside of the whole body. How how quickly do you think this becomes a field that is uh, down the graph, as I call it, like where where more and more people know about it and kind of just accept it as as a part of this? Let, let me let me jump ahead. I I thought I had this thing marked out correctly. Yeah, it seems like you're kind of describing the hello world, right? Like the idea yeah. of of the first time you send a message across. Is there anybody that's not excited about this? Do you find anybody that's like, uh, this is smoke and mirrors or anybody that is resistant to this idea as a scientific concept or, or medicine concept? Uh, sure. Uh, there's, there's a few ways to be resistant to it. Um, one way is, uh, you know, kind of uh, just the fact that there's only 24 hours in a day. So people who uh, are not in this specific field, they are in, you know, they they are in, let's say, you know, mainstream biomedicine or mainstream molecular biology. The attitude often is, I'll, I'll, I haven't read it. I don't know anything about it. I'll, I'll deal with it once it becomes, you know, mainstream, right? Whatever, whatever that means. And okay, fine. Everybody has to make decisions about what they're going to spend their time studying. Um, you know, that's fine. That's a, that's a, that's a personal, that's a personal choice. So, uh, I think, I think that it's going to be, it's, it's harder and harder to ignore this stuff. I mean, it's in very mainstream papers. It's in the textbook now it's in the developmental biology textbook. Um, uh, we had a, we had a, a review in cell about it, uh, last year. So it, it's out there, but, but again, some people just have never heard of it. I, I, I give talks and some people say that, you know, I, that that's, 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 uh, that's amazing, but I've never heard of any of this stuff. How's, you know, how's that possible? Um, there's another, there's another way to, uh, to be skeptical about it. And that is this kind of mainstream assumption that the right level of explanation and interaction with living things has to be at the molecular level. So, okay. So now we're getting back into the levels. Some people really love chemistry. And the idea is that everything of value should be done at the level of chemistry. And I've had this, uh, I've had this happen where I give a talk. And so the first half of my talk is about bioelectricity. And this is, uh, this is, it does, you know, we can do this and this and this. And then in the second half of the talk, I show the mechanism, I show how it works. So when the bioelectric uh, pattern changes, the cells, the decision has been made. Now that percolates down to the control of genes. The decision has been made, the control of expression to the movement of morphogens, to cell shape, to um, epigenetics, all this other stuff. And that's how it, and then you know, people, people have said to me, I, I, I was really interested in the first half of the talk because it sounded amazing. But now that I see the mechanism underneath, now I don't care anymore. Now I just think, well, I can just go, I, I should just be targeting whatever stuff, whatever the underneath mechanisms are. Right. And I, 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 I think that's, that's fundamentally mistaken in a couple of different ways. One, one way, one thing about it is that 
if you're disappointed to see the mechanism, something's really wrong. What did you think was going to be under there? It wasn't going to be magic. It was going to be chemistry. There's no, in physics, there's no getting around that. Nobody, nobody said this was going to be magic. So, so that's, that's the first thing to me, to me, knowing the mechanism is, is better. It doesn't remove the mystery. It makes the whole thing. It makes the whole thing more interesting. The second thing is that it neglects this, this, this neglects, this approach neglects the, the fact that again, interacting with things at the lowest level is extremely difficult. So if you want to make an eye or a limb or something else, and you think you're going to control the tens of thousands of gene, the individual genes and, 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 and millions of cells and everything else, maybe that's possible in some world at some point, that's going to be something you can do. But why, why would you want to control it that way? It's like, okay, think about that with respect to the city. Well, maybe you don't want to use a green waste container maybe you want to keep putting your green waste in the street now you can feel what you want about it you can yell at the garbage truck when he goes by you throw rocks at the garbage truck when he goes by you'll get an interaction from the consciousness of the city in a different way if you start throwing rocks at the garbage truck what you'll probably do is try to engage the city at the level of its own consciousness in order to pursue the agenda that you have. Maybe you think that the city purchasing all of these large 96, um, 96 gallon plastic bins colored green for the containerized green waste is a horrendous thing for the environment because it's just more plastic being produced. And the old way of having the claw and the dude um, was a better way. Maybe you're just seeing the city pursue efficiencies and now the, the guy who runs the claw, you, you have less people employed in the solid waste division, on and on and on and on. But again, you have to pay attention to the layers. It's like, uh, try, you know, it's like... Uh trying to program your computer by, by adjusting the electromagnetic fields. I mean, you could do that, I suppose, but, but, but you're missing the whole point of the device. Evolution has given you this amazing control system that is how the system actually makes information. Why wouldn't you interact with that, right? And um, it sounds like reductionism, except it's not. People say, well, you should be more reductionist. You should go down. It's not really reductionism because they always stop at chemistry. You know, if you push them and you say, Oh, so you want to do this in terms of quantum foam, I guess. And they say, no, 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 that's stupid. No, chemistry is, is the way to go. So that's not really reductionism. That's just picking a level. You know, you have your favorite level and you're sort of stuck there. So lots of people now, you know, Dennis Noble has some beautiful work on um, there being no uh, privileged level of causation in biology. And, and, and the most interesting work is actually uh, the, the Eric Hole. I don't know if you've talked to him or had him on your show, right? But uh, he he uh, he, he Wait, works. Wait, the writer, the the guy that wrote the Revelations, Eric Cole. Correct. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. The podcast knows him well. He's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah he's amazing. And 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 he so so he works at my center. And we we hired him specifically because he has this incredible work on uh, causal emergence, showing that that you can now the question the question of which level of description is it the atoms, is it the molecules, is it the you know tissues, whatever. That used to be a philosophical question that people just had opinions about. No longer. He, he actually produces a mathematical formalism where you can quantify it with math. In other words, not, not, not opinions, but, but you can actually calculate which layer does the most work. And it's not always the lowest layer. That, that problem has been solved. That was kind of, I'm, I'm a... And, and that's, again, this question of scientific relevance amazed that, that that more people aren't on fire about this and i mean some people are but but there should be more known i think it's it's incredibly profound and, and to restate that in a different way to make sure i understand it's to say hey it's not that everything starts on the lowest base layer and is all controlled by that uh, very simple kind of um stephen wolfram new kind of science like the the on off but that actually could be a middle out thing it could be somewhere along the chain uh, somewhere between organs and the molecular level of the cell, it could be some other thing kicks off the, the cascade of reactions that have to happen. Is that right? That, that, that's exactly right. That, that basically what it says is that, is that when you are looking for a good answer to the question of what causes things, right? So, so something happened and, uh, and you say, well, what caused that? And somebody will say, well, it, it, what, what caused it is um, uh, this, this event right here. And then somebody will say, uh, no, no. What really causes it is zoom, zoom down lower. It's when this electron zagged this way rather than this way. That's what really caused it. The other stuff is is, is epiphenomenon. It's, it doesn't really exist, right? 
And so it's like it's it's very much like in, in the in the Wolfram case, you know, when you have your um you have your cellular automata world and you see these gliders, you know, in the game of life, they get these gliders. You could you could be a skeptic about that and you could say there are no gliders. All there are are individual cells in this world, right? They turn on, they they light up or they don't light up, they don't even move. And there's no there's no such thing as a glider. You're just you're imagining that with your with your wacky visual system. But the problem with that is, well, in that in that world, that's a real problem because if you think that way, you won't be motivated to do things like, um, hey, we can build a Turing machine in that world out of gliders as as puffs, you know, puffs of information. You would never do that if you don't believe in gliders, right? So already we know that that there's some benefits to be had about not being um, too, too much of a skeptic about these higher levels, but. Uh, Let yeah. me interrupt you for a second. So for people that aren't familiar with Stephen Wolfram's uh, work, he wrote a book called A New Kind of Science. And I would say one of the most awe-inspiring experiences I've ever had of reading the first 100 pages of a book is him describing that you can either – you can have this binary system. Something is either on or off and very simple rules. If there's on, on, then the next one equals off or the one below it uh, does something else. And from this, Wolfram proves that you can make fantastically int intricate and complex things from just this on-off situation. And what you're describing is, yes, you can get down to the base layer and just say, hey, are they on or off? And, and kind of what's that rule set all the way down at the base? But that Eric Howell's work shows it that's not necessarily just because you can observe those things happening all the way on that on-off. It, the the actual mechanism why it's happening what's occurring what how it's spreading out to other people may not have started at the bottom may have started in the middle may have started at, uh, higher up wh whatever that means and and that should make perfect sense because okay let's let's talk about let's talk about my eye and kermit if i would heaven forbid use my hand in some strange situation. I've been watching Better Call Saul lately. Um, you know, some strange situation, um, you know, need to gouge out my eye and sacrifice the optic nerve for the sake of some other, maybe a child, maybe even, um, or, or maybe a, a total stranger or something else there. There's a whole... There's a whole question of causality that that is that is completely apart from the mechanisms that would normally see a, see an object coming towards my eye and cause me to move. In other words, there are all of these layers going on at the same time. And the Titanic illustration is 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 very helpful because which layer is the relevant layer? Well, even even this is this is a Peugeotian thing depends on where you're standing. Now, I don't know that that's always the most communicative um, articulation in many different contexts. But once if you're seeing this whole thing spatially, it it makes perfect sense. That's 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 correct. the the best The best answer to why is it happening is may not be sometimes it is but sometimes it's not and and eric provides a way to calculate that uh sometimes that answer is at other levels now you know uh, some people in the past some people have this was always treated uh, the, the people have been arguing about this for millennia and so um at one point it was treated as a philosophical thing somebody would just define it and it would say look all causes are causes at the bottom of physics everything else is fluff Everything else is just epiphenomenal. It's like a shadow. It's, it doesn't it doesn't do anything, right? So, and that was an opinion, and that was a way to define you. You know, you could define causes this way. But what what's now clear is that if if by cause you want something that is the most powerful control knob, right? You want to know what is the th what is the leverage point for the system? What is the place where I can give the smallest amount of um, influence to get the most bang for my buck in terms of making things happen? that may not be at the lowest level. And intuitively, it was kind of obvious for a lot of things, but it was never mathematically tractable until until Eric did it. So, I... And you can understand why um, a collection of thinkers over time, people doing the scientific method, would want to say, let us just have an assumption. Whatever the lowest level you can measure it at, that's where the causation happens because it allows you to 
to uh, share some understanding. And when you come to the conclusion like, hey, it might be the base layer, but it might be somewhere in the middle or somewhere far higher, now all of a sudden rules uh, can't, be, can't be created. Um, and it, it, I imagine it makes people feel very uncomfortable. In fact, even for me, like you think about all the things that you think of that you, you base yourself on, causation starts from the base layer and goes out. If you don't have that, then what causes what becomes more complicated. Now, now just go to how many, now we have the meaning crisis space. Let's say we have the, um, the wisdom project space, which is probably a little broader. You know, I'm not, I should probably talk to Chris Williamson at some point. Um, but, you know, I look at his channel often. He's got a lot of good people on, and I, I don't listen to it that often, actually. But every now and then, the YouTube algorithm will serve something up, and I'll, I'll check it out. I, one of his videos, he basically says, well, I think that um, evolutionary biology is, is for, for him, I'll just rephrase it, sort of the interpretive key. Really? Really? So, so this, is, this is really where this, and here's a, the link will be below to, to continue on listening to this. It's a, it's a fascinating, fascinating podcast about this question of, okay, well, what layer is, is determinative? And, and a lot depends on, again, as Peshaw always says, where you're standing. Because so often with a monarchical vision, we imagine a view from nowhere. It's like, no, 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 there's no view from nowhere. You're, 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 you're focusing on a particular thing. You've got a value hierarchy at work, and it's drawing your attention. In fact, that is, that is shaping what you see and what you pay attention to. And now that you know, we can we can phrase it this way. Well, perhaps the electroceuticals will be the new hotness. Well, what is, the new hotness is just sort of a probably in terms of a layer of people, something like a a spirit that is above the people that is drawing our attention. Ooh, now electroceuticals. Twenty years ago or thirty years ago, oh, it was genetics, and and in the future maybe it'll be something else, and. And, you know, what what level is, and, and even the question, okay, which layer is the, let's say, the relevant layer? Well, that depends on relevant for what. And, and this question haunts Weinstein's system. And I think this is exactly where Peugeot wants to engage him and doesn't really happen in this talk. Maybe I'll just keep soldiering through this because at some point I want to jump to about here when we introduce consciousness and that comes out about the one hour mark. But th this other stuff isn't incidental because it has everything to do with, okay, what, you know, Peterson likes using level of analysis, what level, what layer, and, and this even goes in terms of identity pause they have a, a missing level of analysis right in general we can talk about um, the evolution and divergence of species right we have a language for that and we can talk about the nature of individuals but uh, it has been long contentious in my field what the status of groups is and Interestingly, the, uh, the, bi the evolutionary biologists who have focused on adaptation, right, which is understood to be a property of individuals, right? The individuals manifest the adaptations. That level of analysis has been inconsistent with understanding religion because religion is not a property of the individual. Individuals manifest aspects of it, but obviously Catholicism is not an individual. And so to the extent that your toolkit for adaptive evolution is built around properties of individuals or maybe tiny little kin groups, um, you, you don't see its nature. And, and I think this is a Again, I think this is a really important and insightful comment he just made. I used to play a game with Jehovah's Witnesses that they would, Jehovah's Witnesses very reliably came to my neighborhood on Saturday mornings. And if I had the time and if I didn't have family around that would be annoyed or if I had some chairs on the front, um, on the front porch to talk to them, 
I would, I mean, because Jehovah's Witness really wants to talk to me and, and, and share their stuff, but these are sort of the street soldiers. And it's not exactly a fair fight, but, you know, every now and then, you want an unfair fight. You know, if you have a six-year-old and you're playing basketball, most of the time you you, you got to let the, you know, you have pink saps rats. You got to let your kid win 30% of the time or he doesn't want to keep playing, let's say. But every now and then, you know, dad just wants to show that he can, he can still do something in his old dad bod. So the Jehovah's Witnesses would come by and I would start poking around at just how much Jehovah's Witness doctrine this individual person would know. And so I'd start asking questions, you know, rather detailed questions about Jesus and the narrative and all of that. And usually at some point a, a breaker would flip on the on the foot soldiers and they'd say, well, I... Let's. I, I'd like to send someone else over to your house, and and in that sense, the individual Jehovah Witness wasn't identical with the other layer of identity, which is Jehovah's Witnesses per se. The individual foot soldier that has just kind of joined the Jehovah's Witness Church and is going out and has their little watchtower thing and has their um, you know New World Bible and all of those things. Um, they don't. They don't. You know, they haven't thought a lot of Christology and category and so, you know, being kind of a troll perhaps, but just kind of poke around at it. Jehovah's Witnesses per se is at a different level than the individual and they might participate in this level, but, you know, individual results may vary. So, you know, this is a this is a very important thing. Now, now also pay attention to what we're trying to do. We're trying to extrapolate patterns in genetics and in biology onto groups. And, you know, this is this is Brett Weinstein's shtick. This is what he does. So what are books about? This is why, except for of course the evergreen thing, this is this is this is what he does. This is why people listen to him. But does the analogy work? I'm sh I think most of us would say, yeah, it works to some degree. Chris Williamson would say, I think, I think evolutionary, um, I think the evolutionary psychology is sort of the key to unlocking. And Peugeot and I would kind of be a little bit dubious because we'd say that's one level of analysis, but is it really going to be determinative? And again, at what did both of these people want to go into this conversation for? And I think for Peugeot, he understands some of the lower level that he understands. So we're going to get into what Brett Weinstein's religion is, which is sort of a, as Sam from Transfigures pointed out, and you know, I'll do a Verveke thing by constantly pointing to Sam. Well, I want to raise Sam's status because Sam, Sam is a smart guy and a lot of people could benefit listening to Sam, even though he isn't a Trinitarian. <sighs> Sam points out, Brett's sort of a weird Gnostic. Because when he talks about, and he's, he's, he's talked about this in many other places, these the genocidal genetics are sort of like a, a demiurge and consciousness will rush in to save the day to preserve us. Well, what are we? Because you have the individuals, and you have Catholicism or Jehovah's Witness religion or so are we a lineage? And, and I, you know, I, I, profited much from this conversation in terms of I'd never really thought about groups horizontally, lineages vertically, the different so is is Christianity a lineage? Is it a group? What layer of anal level of analysis is best to think about? Now you'll find participation in both ways, but clearly I've profited by the application of an, a biological analogy to thinking about something that I should be familiar with, given that it's my job. Pretty cool. The folks who have done the best with understanding religion in evolutionary terms are the group selectionists, who I believe are actually um, 
using an article of faith that is literally false in order to skip to the level at which you can look at a group and see its behavior as adaptive, which it is. Now, what they're looking at is not, in fact, a group. They've misunderstood the mechanism, but by allowing... Now, it's really important to know here that we are talking about, and we were just talking about, you know, electrical patterns on cells. When we're talking about religious groups through time across cultures all of the made up of individual persons in relationship with one another contextualized within history all made up of cells and i mean there's no talk about combinatorial explosiveness so and i'm sure brett would not question this now we're trying to be work on this scientific relevance to to find maybe the the layer i mean wow i mean i i say that and i pause there because this is the way we talk this is just what we do and there's good reason to try to do it because we're trying to learn and we're trying to get a handle on, we're trying to grasp, we're trying to figure out how to navigate our way through the world. And there's no mathematical model to do this, partly because the telos, the goal, isn't obvious either. Knowing themselves the article of faith that may be which it is. Now, what they're looking at is not, in fact, a group. They've misunderstood the mechanism. But by allowing themselves the article of faith that maybe we can talk about adaptation of something smaller than a species and larger than an individual, right, they have uh, they've built a bridge that allows them to walk into human cultural evolution and see that it often evolves over large numbers of people, which they mistakenly describe as a group, right? So faith is playing yeah. a role in science but I think there. It's interesting because why do, you, why do you believe that a bunch of cells working together is, has, and, and forms an individual, has more reality than a bunch of individuals acting together in a group like why is it that one is more real than the other it's like i'm not even a scientist and i wonder why would anybody think that it's a great question and the answer is because we know exactly why the cluster of cells behaves in the way that it does because the gene count me skeptical and okay so we have skepticism at various levels we know exactly you can't predict peugeot Maybe you can predict the orthodox. And now we're knocking on the door of, of pragmatism here because, well, the group is more predictable than the Peugeot. So, and, and this is part of Peugeot's point because Peugeot is like, okay, you're, you know, you're bottom upping a long ways here. Genomes in each of those cells is identical. And especially when we talk about something like an animal, um, if effectively the cells in your eye have to collaborate with the cells in your liver in order to allow the your gonads to pass on your genes and so what there is in in a creature is perfect agreement on what the objective of the exercise is that does not exist in a cluster of individuals but the question is can you figure out to what extent it does exist and why and so we have several different, uh, I would now say that they are theories. They started as hypotheses. They are now well enough established to be theories about why cooperation exists when you don't have identical genes or uh, disproportionately similar genes. Um, so we have uh, kin selection, which I just described, similar genes driving collaboration. We have reciprocal altruism. I scratch your back if you scratch mine. And we have indirect reciprocity where I participate in a collective in which my back gets scratched and your back gets scratched, but it may not be a, a, an exchange, right? Um, so we have... And, and, you know, again, in fairness, all of these things are are viable, but... If you'd ask him, 
how well can he predict his wife? It's a really interesting question because on one hand, far better than I ever could. I don't know Heather. At the same time, Heather will reliably surprise him. That's the layer of complexity that we are really working with here. And so we know stuff, but we, we, we're not even sure how to talk about this. Have those, uh, those theories of collaboration. What we don't have is a theory of collaboration that scales up properly to things like, um, like Catholicism or Judaism or, uh, or Islam, right? We don't have that. And so what that, te- what, what that results in is too much skepticism amongst evolutionary biologists that these things are in fact adaptive. So I have a, so I, my, my big question is this, is that I think it seems that one of the problems which is making it difficult for people to, to be able to bridge that is because they continue to understand survival at the individual level and then try to see how that survival could be maximized by a group. But what they're not, they're not doing is seeing it at the right level, which is that you're not, so you, you shouldn't look at the survivability of the individual, you should look at the survivability of the group and how it perpetuates itself and then how it reproduces itself into other groups. So, so let's say I was a serial killer who focused on Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, could, I, could, I, could I somehow destroy Jehovah's Witness religion by abducting all of the people who came to my door? That's what you should be looking at, because it's like you're, you're skipping levels on one concept, but you're not skipping levels on the other. So here's the problem with that. The problem is, uh, and I'm not faulting you for this, but when you use the term group, you artificially hobble your explanation, right? What do you mean? Um, a group is, is an, so again, there's a longstanding battle in my field over this. Um, but in the late sixties, early seventies, this got sorted out and then it has been unsorted out, uh, in more recent decades. But what was sorted out, um, by, uh, by, uh, my intellectual ancestors was that although. See, and right there, that grouping is intellectual ancestors. That's the. That's the lineage of biologists, so it's a group lineage. Um, if you take two groups, right, just actual clusters of individuals, um, a group of altruists will outcompete a group of individuals who are selfishly motivated. Mm-hmm. Everybody agrees on this. Yeah. The problem is that if you introduce a selfishly motivated individual into one of these groups of altruists, that individual will outcompete other individuals within the group. And so groups don't evolve because they are taken apart by a collective action uh, conundrum inside the group, right? Okay, and of course, for argument, and, and fair enough, for argument of analysis, you have to have someone who is sort of altru- sufficiently altruistic versus someone who is sufficiently selfish, because of course, every human being is a, is, is a mixture of both. But now in the group, you have all of these cross pressures between them, because in terms of status, they want to show themselves as being altruistic, if that's the value within the group, or in other groups, they want to show themselves as being cutthroat and selfish. Again, I'm watching Better Call Saul, and, and I'm, watching, I'm watching Jimmy and his wife you know, how, how bad are they going to do things to HHM? Right. Now, what this leaves us with is a world full of things that look like groups that appear to collaborate for which we do not have an explanation. And my argument would be, and I I think much of what you've said is quite accurate, um, that these things that look like groups, the ones that are evolutionarily robust, are actually lineages, okay? And a lineage is not a group subject to that same uh, tension between individual and collective well-being. A lineage is actually something that selection can act on. And so the point is selection there can turn the tables on the individual who uh, would profit at the expense of the other members of the collective, 
and it can produce larger level adaptive phenomena like religions. So um, in any case, all I would argue is what you're calling a group is actually a lineage. And because it's a lineage, it has evolutionary, it has an evolutionary nature that is not present in something that would actually be a group, right? And, and again, I thought this was such a cool answer. I, I really enjoyed this answer because what it did was sort of open my mind. And now I'm thinking much more in three dimensions. I'm thinking not just in terms of, say, group as in at this point in time. Now I'm thinking about going through time. Now, of course, you've got all these dynamics going both ways. And 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 we're we're doing this at levels of so 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 what is the delineation between a Dutch reformed minister and a Jehovah's Witness foot soldier that both live in Sacramento, California, that both maybe have a similar income, that both perhaps are about the same age and so were raised in a similar similar context and culture. Again, the combinatorial explosiveness of the variables. And and this Dutch Calvinist is is you know 240 pounds and six foot four and um, has a either a glorious or a menacing beard depending on your social cultural situation and even the action which to might to me might look altruistic that I I am trying to debate them to talk them out of what I think is a is a deficient worldview while while they then perhaps are getting defensive and so finding me aggressive and threatening by asking really naughty questions about the um, the exact nature of their Christ and their devil and the relationship between the two of them. I mean, what I'm what I'm calling a group is any any, let's say what we call individuals, like any individuals that are acting together towards a common purpose. That's what I call a group. And so for me, like my theory applies to Google and and Facebook as much as it applies to families, that is applies to countries, that is as it applies to any type of co- any type of space where different individuals are align themselves towards a purpose. Uh, and some groups are more functional than others. Obviously, some groups are less, and some groups will tend to devour its members. You know, and some groups will tend to make them flourish. Uh, and that there are different ways in which ways to set that up so that it's the it's the most uh, coherent let's say and the now now peugeot in case you didn't notice sees these groups as surrounded around purpose around a telos that's going to be difficult especially in a biological sense especially in a darwinian sense because the only telos the 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 frame is the frame is really existential and temporal. It's getting into the future. But, you know, I, I, the Catholicism of 2020, what's the relationship between the Catholicism of 2020 and the Catholicism of 1920? Now, by virtue of the age of Catholicism, there's a lot more commonality between the Catholicism of 2020 and the Catholicism of 1920 than there is the Jehovah's Witnessism of 2020 and the Jehovah's Witnessism of 1920. Because if you know anything about Jehovah's Witness, they've had to do a lot of retooling by virtue of the specific elements of their system. But again, there's what do you, what do you mean their system? Their, their system isn't biological, although it goes down into the biology. Their system is cognitive. Their system is upper register. The purpose is the survivability of the group itself. Right. But this is exactly the problem, is that if you mm-hmm. if you take a, a hypothesis robust enough to explain something like uh, Catholicism, and you say, well... Google has a lot of the properties of, you know, a collective that uh, engages, you know, of a congregation, right? And it does. Indeed, it has many of those properties, but it doesn't have all of them. 
And what you will see is that they behave differently over time, precisely because of this issue about the individual who behaves selfishly in a group uh, profiting at the expense of the group. Mm -hmm. Right. So ultimately, you would expect things like Google uh, to fail to function in a coherent fashion. And in fact, I, I would argue we are seeing that. We are seeing the, in, the incentives of the individuals who decide what Google does betraying Google, right? They are actually hobbling the entity uh, to enrich themselves, which is exactly what you would expect. And you don't see that in a, a, an ancient religion. You may see it in a cult or something that has just emerged, but something that has stood the test of time will have stood the test of time because it has structures in it that prevent that from happening. Yeah. Well, the, the way that I like to talk about that is that it has to do with purpose. Like this is difficult because obviously purpose is a difficult in terms of directed action maybe is the best way to like a, a way to use a word that's more scientifically appropriate. And so depending on the directed action, it will also affect the structures that will set themselves up, you know. It, it, in the way, it, what what's going to happen in that group. And so one of the things that religion has done or different religions is to try to identify the highest direction for action. And so in, in terms of Christianity, the high or point of attention, we can use the word point of attention because attention is what directs action. And so in Christianity, the highest point of attention is something like the infinite source of the world, which is also love. And so that is our point of attention. And so we bind ourselves together in that, in the direction towards that point. So what will happen is sometimes parasitical systems will set themselves up. That's inevitable. It's going to happen. But because the, the point of attention is something like the, the infinite source of the world and, and uh, that it is bound in love, then there'll be self, self, uh, repairing mechanisms which will also be part of that group because at some point the there'll be a judgment right you'll notice that the leader is not in line with what the group is supposed to be and so there'll be some mechanism to eliminate the the parasite but in google there's none of that like in these massive corporations there it's only to make money it's only to to to, to grow your 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 it's in fact using attention for the purpose of making money now now, now, what's what's helpful to see here is, and, and and Brett sort of made this point in terms of ancient traditions. There's been a continual focus to to actually get down to something efficient and durable enough that it scales radically through lots of other systems, and. You know, he said, okay, the point here is love. Now, obviously, you're going to want to talk about what love is, but what, and this is where we begin to see Peugeot's religion, because God is love, find it in First John. Love is understood as, you know, what happens, what dro drives Jesus to the cross. Love is what drives Jesus out of the grave back into the world. What love is what drives Jesus to ascend so that the comforter may come. Love is what so this is this is Peugeot's religion. Big surprise, it's Christianity. And I think maybe this is a good place to stop and maybe the next time um, now that we've looked at the layers, this this one layer of love brings the thing together. Okay? Now, and and again, his question with Brett is, Brett will say, we have this demiurge, and then we have consciousness where we can choose the good, and Peugeot will say, where do you stand in order to choose the good? Well, that's consciousness, because consciousness can evaluate. Okay, but where are you getting the value system from? You're not getting the value system from the demiurge. And consciousness is a byproduct, a mistake, that's what Brett will say, a mistake done by the um, the, the certainly non-omniscient, non-all-wise, definitely non-merciful demiurge, in a sense, what in Brett's system, we have 
through emergence, transcended the demiurge that brought us into being through consciousness. And now what we, boy, who's we, what we have to do is keep us going. Well, what is us? How, how, what level of analysis determines the identity of us? Is it genetic? The genetic is the source of the demiurge. It, are, are we, the, the genes, the genocidal genes want to push themselves into the future. And, and what Peugeot basically says, well, it's this, it's this drive to love. And in a way, humanity... This is this is the irony, because humanity is not at the top of Peugeot's hierarchy, where it is at Brett's. So, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to have the stamina. <laughs> David. Um, David Fuller said, I'm, 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 the, I'm the YouTuber with the most stamina. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to have the mu enough stamina to actually do commentary on all three hours of this conversation. But I want to at least illuminate aspects of it, of, of both where, again, I thought, you know, I, I like doing these things, taking time to do them because the whole lineage thing was like, bang, oh yeah, time groups, time, lineage, that's going to be working around in my noodle for a while. But we have to get to Brett's religion because I think what they really want to have here is a religious conversation, even though even though they're, they're having difficulty finding each other in terms of a definition of religion, but they want to have a conversation about ultimates that actually gets to be able to filter down and say, what then should we do? And Peugeot's answer is going to be love. And to a degree, that's Brett's answer, because I would say that, you know, you don't have to smuggle Jesus because people are already simply adopting his much of his value system. They're just skeptical about his strategy. And I think that's where Brett differs because Brett's strategy is going to be fundamentally modern. And that's where on the larger landscape that I tried to set this on, I never have time to actually finish these grand projects. When we compare to someone like Kings North or even Jordan B. Cooper, the Lutheran theologian, it's going to differ. So enough for today. Um, hope this was helpful. I'll probably, I had a good conversation today. I'll probably put that conversation in the middle of this so that people get a chance to work this through their system because people like different videos and I put out so much. So thank you for your time and attention and leave a comment, engage in the conversation.